Hey guys, can you hear me okay? Cool. Do you guys want to come in the front? I meant this to be a very intimate uh, talk. And yeah, we can keep it more conversational that way as well. Sweet, yeah. So today I'm going to talk about fraud prevention in Web3 and uh, a little bit about myself. So I used to lead risk and fraud for Coinbase for about four years, 2015 to 2019, and then later I was leading financial crime uh, globally for Revolut, the UK-based challenger bank. And uh, we started Sardine about two and a half years ago. Uh, we had a, a venture-backed business uh, uh, with a focus on risk-free payments. And today I'm gonna be talking about all the various fraud vectors uh, that me and my team have seen through the course of Sardine as well as prior to Sardine uh, uh, at various places. So uh, yeah, uh, this is a quote from Simon Taylor who heads continent strategy for us, who's sitting way, way, way in the front. And uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of things in Web3, which is you know, crypto, DeFi, NFT, et cetera, it's kind of like the wild, wild west right now. And until you, uh, you know, create the right rules and regulations in place, right, it, 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 it is like the wild, wild west when it comes to fraud prevention, right? So, uh, and then there's this other saying which uh, Angela Strange, who is on our board, has, which is that every company will be a fintech, and we added a caveat to it saying, unless fraud doesn't kill them first. And... Uh, on the flip side, you know, what we have seen is that uh, today in this day and age, you can hail an Uber within a few minutes. You can do KYC at your favorite uh, fintech or crypto app within a few minutes as well. But then after you've done all of that, as in after you've done the KYC, you're still actually stuck waiting for the money to load into your fintech wallet so that you can actually start spending on it, right? Because of the rudimentary uh, payment rails of ACH, et cetera, where it takes several, several days for funds to settle, you're just essentially now stuck waiting for the funds to settle before you can use the app, right? And now, the, if you really drill down into why is it that people are waiting for the funds in the new bank wallet, it's really because of fraud. Because all the new banks, they want to make sure that the funds truly settle before they actually allow you to spend it, right? Uh, but basically, it turns out that you know, billions of dollars are being lost to account funding fraud uh, every year. And now, if you look at the landscape of uh, where fintechs are operating, they have very complex fund flows, right? Because you could bring money in from cards, wires, in future RTP, FedNow, et cetera. And then you could actually spend it using a physical card. You can create a virtual card and spend it using that. You could do peer-to-peer -peer transfer out. You could buy crypto. Uh, you could buy stocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in these complex fund flows, the problem of fraud management becomes increasingly complex, right? And one of the other uh, fa factoids that we often get asked is, hey, yeah, today, you know, ACH and cards are primary means of loading money in a wallet, and, you know, Sardine helps various companies prevent fraud uh, at that uh, account funding stage, what happens once you start getting uh, RTP and FedNow becoming more prevalent, right? So, uh, and of course, we are, we, it's projected that you know, RTP, FedNow, and other push payment methods, the amount of money that they're going to move in 2023 is going to reach a trillion, right? Uh, but our conjecture is that even in the future stage, when you have you know, uh, RTP, FedNow, et cetera, these are faster payment methods. It just means it's a faster way for a victim to lose their money, right? And we've seen quite a bit of that. So there are a bunch of articles that I'm sure you guys have read about Zell scams, right? Which is, you know, people are being defrauded uh, by clever uh, uh, attackers. And I have a few typologies which describe that in detail later. Uh, and we don't really have to look very, very far. We just have to look across the pond to the UK to see what happened over there when they actually implemented faster payments. So they implemented faster payments, let's say, five, six years ago. Uh, the amount of money that people are using to what UK calls authorized push payment fraud, which is APP fraud, is now more than the amount of money people lost to card fraud in the UK. 
And then the UK had to essentially uh, yeah, get like some of the top banks together, I believe it's seven banks who are part of it, to set a pot of money aside such that they can establish liability. Like if someone is sending money from one bank to the other, and this sending bank has not verified uh, yeah, the, the, the recipient via confirmation of payee, then the responsibility lies with the sending bank, otherwise with the receiving bank, right? So we really don't have to look very far. Once Fed now, RTP really take off, and you know, uh, if the indication from Zellscam is true, the fraud rates on those payment rails will be really, really high, and we will have to you know, create a very similar setup here in the US as well. So yeah, en enough about the, the landscape about payments. Now what I really wanted to get into is uh, uh, you know, talk about a few of the fraud typologies that we have seen. And uh, one of the first ones I want to mention is the classic tech support scam. So in the tech support scam, uh, what the, the you know, like folks are advertising fake uh, phone numbers for, let's say, Coinbase support, or Robinhood support, or Gemini support, et cetera, you call up that number, it's not really Coinbase tech support, which is actually answering the phone, and then they convince you, uh, or you may have a, a problem with your account, so you may have you know, some funds which are locked, you want access to those funds, so then these attackers, they uh, socially engineer you into thinking they are the real tech support. Number two, they get you to download remote screen sharing tools like TeamViewer or AnyDesk, Citrix, there's a variety of those tools. And then uh, they uh, essentially take control of your computer, they're moving the mouse, they can type on your behalf, and in all of these tools there's a, a, a setup where the attacker can actually blank out the screen when the victim is not paying attention. They blank out the screen and then they withdraw the funds to a wallet that the attacker only controls. Right, and uh, this is a very uh, fast-growing uh, uh, typology. As in, like 2017, when uh, I was leading fraud at Coinbase, this was one of the you know fastest-growing, but still on the small dollar amount side. But probably now, you know, uh, th there was a report by FT by CFPB uh, or FTC, I forget, which stated that the amount of fraud that was uh, uh, in the crypto exchanges has exceeded a billion dollars in the last 14 months, and a bunch of it, or the bulk of it, is actually because of this typology. Right. The same typology, the tech support scam, takes a different flavor as well. It's called the crypto investment scam, uh, or the investment advisor scam. In this case, you, know, you will get a call from someone claiming to be an investment advisor. They'll say, hey, I can get you to buy a lot of crypto, and I can help you with it. And they essentially now walk you through setting up an account uh, on a Coinbase or a Gemini or what have you, right? Now, if you think about it, KYC, identity, uh, uh, et cetera, they'll all check out because it's the victim, they're doing their own KYC. It's the victim's own IP address. It's the victim's own device ID, victim's phone number. Everything will check out, everything will be kosher, right? Uh, and of course, the only thing that doesn't check out is that the, 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 the crypto will be actually withdrawn and sent to a wallet controlled by the attacker. And the only way of actually uh, detecting these types of scams is essentially by looking at what's happening on the client side, right? So essentially, uh, what we've developed at Sardine is technology which would look at, you know, are there multiple people controlling the screen? Are there multiple people who are, you know, typing together? Right? And those are the only ways via which you can actually really know that it's not the victim doing their own KYC, it's someone else doing it on their behalf or guiding them through it. Then, uh, Zell scams are uh, very similar. So, uh, one, one thing that I have noticed is that, you know, because crypto is not reversible and it's also fungible and you can withdraw it and you can spend it instantly, so most of the highest sophisticated fraud attacks, they start from the crypto industry, and then there's a trickle-down effect into others, right? So crypto started seeing this social engineering scams, which took those flavors of crypto investment advisor or tech support scams starting 2016, 2017, right? 
And now that Zelle has grown in, in immense popularity, that same scam is happening on Zelle, right? Uh, Zelle, it takes two types of flavors, right? So the first flavor is that, you know, you're using Zelle to buy something and uh, you never receive the goods, right? So that's your, that's your classic goods not received uh, fraud, right? But then the other one is the, the one which is uh, similar to the crypto investment advisor scam in that, you know, uh, you basically get a phone call from someone who then uh, says that, hey, uh, you have won the lottery or, you know, you have some refund waiting for you. I'm going to help you get that refund from the bank. But before you get the refund, I need to verify that you have possession of your bank account. And the way you verify possession of your bank account is that you actually put some money, uh, take some money out of your bank account and put it in this other account, right? And uh, they, these con artists are so clever, they've been able to dupe elderly victims of th thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, right? And they take the, the uh, and in the process of doing the scam, they're doing the same thing, the same tactic, right? They're convincing the victim or guiding the victim into doing these things over TeamViewer, right? Now, um, <clears throat> besides the tech support scam, there's this other uh, typology that we often see, which is money mules. Right? So there's this movie which just recently came out. I haven't seen it, but uh, several of my colleagues have, and you know, highly recommend Emily the Criminal. So uh, uh, a money mule would be, you know, uh, essentially uh, somebody contacts you on a, you know, Instagram forum or a Facebook forum saying, hey, uh, what is the limit on your Coinbase account? Or what is the limit on your, you know, uh, Gemini account? If you have a high limit of purchasing, right, uh, I need to buy Bitcoin really, really quickly. Can I actually uh, uh, you know, buy it from your account? And then essentially what happens is that you give control of your Coinbase account, let's say, to uh, this attacker who now, uh, what they will do is they'll add, you know, a bunch of stolen bank accounts into it, right? And then they're going to proceed to buy crypto using those stolen bank accounts, and then they will withdraw that crypto right, into a wallet that they control, right? And now the victim has been used as a, as a shell almost, right? And uh, of course, the person who owned the stolen bank accounts will come back and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, this, they, they'll, they'll, they'll do a chargeback or they'll file an ACH return, right? So in crypto or in NFT, we see this other uh, very classic uh, scam pattern, which is, uh, you know, one where people are willing to make a loss on an NFT trade, right? So, for example, you know, I would, uh, 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 let's say I'm Alice, I use a stolen card to buy an NFT worth one ETH, right? And then, because I have used a stolen card to buy the NFT, I don't mind making a loss on it. I'm not going to try to sell it as quickly as possible to someone else, and even if the price of ETH has gone down, I, I don't mind actually selling it for exactly one ETH, or maybe even lower than one ETH, but at the end of the day, I have actually got that, that you know, uh, I get the cash back from the, the seller, right? And here's another very interesting one, uh, which is this uh, smart contract token allowance scam. Uh, what's been happening with a lot of, uh, uh, smart contracts is that, of course, there are companies like uh, Quantstamp, et cetera, who are verifying the authenticity and veracity of a smart contract, saying that, hey, it's not doing anything illegal. But still, in Ethereum, what has happened is that there is something called a token allowance. So what you could do is you could say, uh, you could give unlimited token allowance to, uh, to a smart contract. All, all that means is a fancy way of saying that, hey, this smart contract can actually take all of my money out of my wallet, right? And the reason why people actually do it, the, the, the real valid reason for doing it is because then you have a good user experience, right? You don't have to keep uh, uh, spending gas to actually do things. You can actually just give unlimited allowance and the smart contract, if it were trustworthy, would have done the right things for you. But it turns out there's a bunch of smart contracts uh, which have been created by these clever scammers, which get these unlimited uh, token allowance. And now comes the second part. So let's say I gave unlimited token allowance from my MetaMask wallet. Now, uh, let's even say I don't have any funds in it right now, right? 
So now the scammer is just waiting. They, they, they're they're going to wait and until I actually do anything with my MetaMask wallet. Now, let's say I wanted to actually buy crypto because the price of crypto has, uh, you know, I, I expect to make a profit, so I immediately want to buy ETH. I buy the ETH, right, using my card, and as soon as I buy the ETH, it's actually gone out the other way, right? And I have no idea why did it go away. So who am I going to go blame? I'm going to go actually go and do a chargeback with my card company saying, I never received the goods. The goods in this case were Ether, right? And uh, a lot of uh, uh, the card fraud or card chargebacks that we see in the crypto on-ramps that we service or the crypto exchanges that we service is because of this, right? So, uh, yeah, so basically where it comes down to is, and we're exploring this uh, as well, is we need almost like a very sign for, you know, Web3. You need to have, like, a reputation score for various smart contracts, right? There's no other way of doing it. Now, here's the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, very interesting uh, thing that's happening in the industry. As you have uh, Apple Pay, Google Pay, et cetera, taking off, right, fraudsters have now realized that they can actually rely on the reputation of Apple uh, to actually layer their fraud. So for example, if I am able to convince Apple by connecting a stolen card into it that it's actually a good card, now I have a highly trustworthy payment method that I can use to do anything else, right? So I take a stolen card, put it into Apple, and then I use Apple Pay to go and buy something, maybe crypto, right? And of course, you know, the person whose card got stolen, they're gonna do a chargeback, right? Now, what we've observed is that, you know, there's, there's this classic sort of trade-off here between privacy, which is Apple's uh, uh, stance, versus the ability to prevent fraud, right? So simple things like, you know, that you'd rely on, like uh, looking at the BIN number uh, from the, the card number to prevent fraud doesn't apply anymore because you don't have access to the, the BIN number at all, right? Because Apple, would, Apple Pay, they tokenize the, bin, uh, the, the full PAN, and uh, what they are then giving you is what they call a DAN, which is basically a device uh, account number. It's really just a fancy way of saying it's a device ID, right? And uh, you know, some of the, the techniques that we employ to essentially fight fraud in such cases is, you know, like what we look for is that, hey, is the same uh, Apple pa DAN, or that is Apple device ID, being used across multiple accounts with different names, for example, right? And this is, uh, you know, uh, one of the last typologies before I move on to the next topic about how do we go about detecting these things. So this is now, uh, you know, uh, for SMB neobanks or S uh, SMB fintechs, you know, what are the vectors we see? So one classic vector that we uh, uh, just helped one SMB neobank uncover is the following. Uh, so I use, a, you know, a... a uh, I, I create a, a, a new email domain, and I create an account at the SMB FinTech with that email domain, right? Uh, and then I link a stolen bank account to it. And then after that, I essentially proceed to uh, create lots of payees, right? Each of those payees, you know, will have their own names, they will have their own email addresses, and I'll connect, like, different bank accounts into it, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in like millions of dollars via the stolen bank account because I'm trying to deplete the stolen bank account and I'm gonna pay my payees, right? So it's, it was very, very, very clever, very, uh, uh, and just goes to show because of the complex funds flows that I alluded to earlier that fintechs have, the attack surface for fintech fraud has, has increased dramatically, right? So you no longer have to just protect at the, you know, uh, uh, inflow, you have to also watch the outflows. So yeah, so uh, uh, how do you go about detecting uh, a bunch of these uh, typologies and fraud techniques, right? So this is a GIF which is showing how do we go about detecting uh, these social engineering scams done via TeamViewer, AnyDesk, Citrix, et cetera. This GIF is showing TeamViewer in particular. So, uh, uh, it keeps looping. So what you'll see is that someone is remotely controlling my screen, and then they are going to this demo page of Sardine, right? 
via TeamViewer, they are accessing it. And they're moving the mouse on my screen and they're typing on my computer. And as you can see over there, in real time, actually within hundreds of milliseconds, we can detect use of TeamViewer, right? Client side. And then we actually use that as a factor into preventing the money from leaving the FinTech or the crypto app. So yeah, uh, the, the main, our main uh, learning has been that in order to fight fraud, there's no silver bullet, right? So of course, you know, we built lots of uh, device and behavior specific features, right? So we look at how people type, swipe, scroll, tap, et cetera, how they hold the phone, all of that. But besides that, we also gather a lot of identity signals. So we gather signals about the email, uh, email intelligence signals. We gather signals from telcos about the phone intelligence. We also look at uh, yeah, uh, uh, various data from various bank consortiums and uh, card networks, et cetera, right? And then at the end of the day, you have to always keep up with the fraud techniques and continue to train your machine learning models while actually uh, yeah, uh, looking at also the new typologies that are happening, defining them, and creating new rules to catch those typologies. Some of the uh, very interesting observations we've had, for example, has been the following, right? So uh, on the right-hand side, uh, what I'm showing here is that we, we were looking at, you know, uh, uh, what are the various fields, uh, what are the various keyboards that people use uh, in different fields? So we observed that, you know, in, in the address field, fraudsters are very likely to use things like control X. And we were wondering, why would you use control X? Control X, just to remind you all, is to actually delete stuff, right? And we figured out that they're probably going through, cycling through, you know, multiple account creations. Every time they're creating an account, something was already there from before. Maybe it was autofill. And they're using control X to immediately delete it. Highlight, delete, right? On the left-hand side, uh, we, uh, you can see, you know, things like, you know, why are they using control O? Because they, they want to do things fast. So they don't want to use the mouse to open a link. They just want to use the, the keyboard to open a link. So they'll use control O. Then uh, what we've also seen is, you know, uh, things like mouse movement behavior. Uh, so it's, it, it's intuitive, right? Like if I am going to a website, uh, to load money in a fintech wallet or to purchase crypto for the first time, my mouse movement is gonna be kinda of all over the place. I'm really just getting acquainted with the look and feel of the website. But if I'm a fraudster who's been to that site like thousands of times, my mouse movement is gonna be in a very, very narrowly defined area, right? And, you know, uh, looking at context switches and distractions, right? Are they pausing while typing? Right? Because if, if I am remotely controlling someone and asking them to do something for me, the victim is going to you know, take lots of pauses while typing stuff. Right? Uh, similarly, you know, if I am opening an account using someone's stolen identity, I would pause a lot as well, and I would dis be distracted quite a bit as well. So yeah, so those were um, you know, just a, a quick overview of you know, technically uh, how we go about solving for fraud. Uh, but the other meta point I wanted to make here was that you know, regulatory policies also need to evolve with the new uh, uh, fintech uh, use cases that we have started to see, right? So for example, uh, with the sudden rise in Zell scams, uh, CFPB has actually taken notice, and they, they are now uh, 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 thinking about classifying you know, authorized push payment fraud, which is basically Zell scams, under Reg E. So which means that uh, if this passes, then which it would mean that the, uh, 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 the, the sending banks would be responsible for making the victims whole. Because today, a victim of Zell scam, actually uh, nobody makes them whole. So that's a great first step, right? Uh, hopefully that passes. But then on the other side, the other thing that we've seen is that, you know, uh, uh, besides all the third-party fraud techniques that I described earlier, third-party because all those fraud techniques were being done by someone else, but there's also a big first-party fraud problem in fintechs, right? The first-party party fraud problem is that, you know, we often see fintechs would tell us that, hey, uh, you know, 
uh, my customer claims that the ATM never gave them the cash, right? Uh, when was the last time, you know, Chase or BOFA had to deal with anything like that? They don't because they would immediately uh, blacklist that individual and then that individual would not be able to open another bank account because of the prevalence of, you know, bank-led consortiums where they're sharing this information with each other. But a Chime or, or uh, uh, a Brex, uh, they can't do that, right? There's no consortium which is helping fintechs actually collaborate with each other, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, there are some uh, steps which are going in the right direction. So Visa came out with uh, uh, this new rule, Visa CE 3.0, which is essentially uh, about handling or preventing first-party fraud, right? So what that rule says is, uh, for example, today you could claim, like, you know, you use your, your car to buy crypto, and when the price of crypto goes down, you could easily claim, hey, I didn't use my card. Someone else took it, right? But with this new CE 3.0 rule, merchants like crypto exchanges would then get the power, or the ability at least, to, to dispute it by essentially providing evidence to the contrary, that hey, it was actually indeed the, 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 this, this person, this individual, who was using their card because, look at this, I have their IP address. I also have the device identifier. Right? So there are some steps going in the right direction to fight first party fraud, at least from the card side. We, need, we, we definitely need you know, uh, 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 big changes to happen on the bank side as well. And here's another interesting push and pull we are already starting to see. So, uh, <clears throat> so now, like going back to the very first example that I was giving you, which is social engineering to buy crypto. Right? Uh, or socially engineering someone uh, to buy crypto. So you would think that wires are not reversible, right? So typically, once you know, you've done a wire, you know, nobody can claw it back, right? But turns out that most crypto exchanges nowadays are being asked to actually reverse the wire as well, right? And the reason for that is the following. You know, like the same elder, elderly scam that I said earlier, right? Like, let's say I call up an elderly victim. I tell them, hey, you know, uh, I'll help you create an account on Coinbase, et cetera, because uh, you know, the price is going to go up. And then I convince you to wire money into the Coinbase account. So, so far, so good, right? How, however, of course, the crypto that was buy, bought using the wire is going out the other way into the attacker's pocket. So now the victim realizes it, and then they're like, hey, you know, where did my crypto go? And they'll try to reverse the wire, right? Now, uh, What's, what's happening now is this push and pull between fintechs and banks, or crypto exchanges and banks. So the crypto exchanges are waking up to this problem of you know, seeing that you know, uh, when, when victims are being socially engineered via ACH, then the crypto exchange is on the hook for the money, right? Whereas uh, if it was actually a wire, then the bank, th then, then actually no one is responsible. The victim is actually just, just short of the money. So what crypto exchanges are saying is that in high-risk scenarios, why should I actually use ACH? I'll just ask the victim to actually push money via, via, via wires. And then <laughs> it's no one's responsibility, right? And therefore we think that, or we, we, we certainly think that, you know, there's going to be a time uh, or where the fintechs and the banks will actually eventually need to sit down together at, at the table and discuss about this issue because otherwise it's, 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 it's going to be this never-ending battle of liability shifting, right? On that note, one of the things that we are super interested in doing and we are setting up is we are setting up a, a, a working group to bring fintechs, crypto exchanges, and banks together so that we can start having a discussion about exactly those problems as I described just earlier, right? Addressing first-party fraud being one of them, and addressing uh, you know, this uh, liability shift between ACH and wires, for example, during social engineering scams being another, right? And we are planning to host uh, you know, the evening before Money 2020 on October 23rd in Vegas. We are hosting like an invite-only uh, discussion. So if anyone here in the audience is interested, come find me, and would love to have as many people as possible. So that's basically it. Uh, if any of you have any questions, I'm happy to take. I don't know if there's a, there's a mic here. Uh, I know I, we, I still have 10 minutes, so I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to details, 
or we can end here, and I'm going to be hanging out there and happy to take questions over there too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have a question? Do you want to shout out? Yeah, go for it. That is a great question. So uh, 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 just to repeat the question. So uh, the question is, are there any uh, cases where we've been brought as an expert witness? Uh, not yet. However, I would imagine that once the Visa CE 3.0 comes into effect, uh, then that is where you know, uh, we would enable merchants to represent right, uh, via the device ID and the fingerprint and IP address information that we capture. right. Other questions? Yeah, so the question is, if I got it right, uh, what are the lessons from setting up consortiums like Early Warning, which could apply to like a consortium which is being set up to help fintechs, right? That's a great question. Um, uh, luckily, I don't have to be the one who's actually doing it, and the, the, the person or the gentleman that we hired uh, comes from Early Warning Systems. Uh, you know, he was the Ravi Loganathan. He was the chief data officer at EWS. He is tasked with actually creating this consortium. And... Uh, so there are some lessons to be taken over there. It's ve number one, it's very difficult to start a consortium because it's always a chicken and egg problem. You have to have a few participants saying that, hey, we are willing to you know, provide our data. We want, we're willing to be the first ones, right? Once you have the first ones there, then it's easier afterwards, right? Uh, uh, but then the, the, on the other side, with a setup like EWS, which is actually co-owned by top seven banks in the US, right? So that is why it worked, but it also uh, led to uh, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, it not being able to be broadened wider beyond it. So therefore, you know, like when we set it up, we would set it up in a way such that uh, it's not really Sardine running it. We want it to be an industry-wide collaboration, coordination, and, and such that it's beneficial for the whole ecosystem, right? Other questions? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Go for it. So, yeah. Um, how quickly do you see uh, your customers action on the information you're giving to them? Because let's say in your homepage example, somebody's logged in via team viewer and they can discover this. I imagine you said it's in an order of milliseconds, like hundreds of milliseconds, mm -hmm. right? So now, like, is the responsibility of your clients to intervene after you tell them that? Yeah, it happens instantly because, you know, uh, so number one, the attack itself happens instantly, right? Because they blank out the screen and you don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> they're essentially just making a, a, a withdrawal to their own wallet, right? Uh, <clears throat> and the detection also, therefore, has to be real time. And in our case, it is real time. Hundreds of milliseconds, we can catch it happening, uh, uh, you know, like the first instance we see multiple people controlling the screen, typing together, et cetera, et cetera. Then we and, uh, immediately pop up or send a response and the crypto exchange can pop up an alert yeah. warning users not to do what, whatever they're doing, right? right? Yeah. And um, do you see that increasing friction on their end at all? Like so crypto exchanges already have a bad UX. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, they, they are always willing to try more friction uh, in that case, right? However, like the real answer here is that 
depending on how accurate this technology can be is, is, is what you have to look at because you don't want to throw friction on everyone trying to withdraw, right? Uh, in our case, you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, we wouldn't claim it's 100% accurate because it's a statistical machine learning based system, uh, but it's accurate to the extent that, you know, uh, crypto exchanges are not receiving lots of people coming back and complaining you didn't allow me to withdraw, right? Yeah, question there? Yeah, so yeah, the question is, uh, yeah, classic uh, privacy versus fraud trade-off, right? So with uh, um, Apple, Google, et cetera, preventing fingerprinting, like Apple already prevents fingerprinting in iOS, Brave Browser prevents fingerprinting. Uh, so how do, how do we stay ahead of the curve over there? So we are, we are actually prepared for it in the sense that uh, we don't